Paul Bertarelli reporting for AvWeb. This is our uh, second podcast with uh, Jason Blair, who's a, a flight instructor and experienced designated examiner in a previous uh, podcast. We talked about um, trends in flight training. And since he's at DPE, we're going to throw some questions at him with regard to what he sees on check rides. So you've been doing this long enough uh, to have seen some ups and downs in check rides. Uh, what kinds of things are you seeing today in applicants that come to you from various sources? Sure. And I think this is a great question, right? I mean, this is the, the rare opportunity where everybody gets to ask the examiner questions instead of the examiner being the one asking. So, um, you know, and as I, as we talked earlier, I like data and it's kind of interesting. Um, you know, we have less DPEs than we used to have. So there's a, a pretty good core of us. There's about 900 or so that are, are doing this across the country. And um, some of the trends that we keep seeing do give us some indications and everybody's always worried about that check ride, right? You know, what's going to happen. Um, the good news is most people, pass and that's been something that's been um, pretty static for a long time and when we look at the pass rates on practical tests we, we see that that you know private level test um, always tends to run somewhere about the uh, um, the 78 to 80 percent pass rate um, you know the instrument rating is is very very similar to that and uh, the dreaded CFI check right everybody thinks that you know everybody's going to fail it right one in ten and it's actually really not that um, we've seen increases in pass rates on that over the last couple of years and has always run kind of 65 to 70 percent range for pass rates so everybody's pretty scared about these check rides but what it does mean is most of the instructors out there are, are doing a pretty good job and and their, their folks are passing so um they're coming through and i will tell you as an examiner uh, we approach every check ride as a you've passed until you do something that doesn't meet the standards really all we're there for is to check those standards um if you meet the acs or pts standards depending on which test you're taking uh, means you're going to pass. So um, go into it a little bit of a little confidence if you're taking a check ride, knowing that you know what you're doing. And then um, if you've practiced well and you consistently meet those standards, you're, you're going to pass. Um, you know, we see a lot of the, the same types of things that are common failure points. Everybody knows that the short field landings are some of the harder ones on the commercial that uh, um, that, that power off 180 tends to be one that catches a lot of people. Um, in a lot of cases, it's decision making things that we find really drives somebody to the failure. And, and Paul, you and I were talking a little bit earlier. I've got in the background here, picture my old Stinson and um, I fly that to a lot of check rides. And it's interesting how many times uh, I'll have the conversation in the morning early, boy, the weather's a little scuzzy out there. I was thinking of flying to you, um, but I think it's probably not good enough for me to fly to get to your check ride today. Are we still doing it? Is the weather good? And if the answer is yes, boy, that should be a, a question, right? I mean, if the examiner's not willing to fly in the weather to get to your check ride is it is it good enough for you to do the check ride and and i kind of use that as a as a, an example because we get that check ride itis we all want to get it done and um you know look at the conditions on the day look at what's happening and okay so if the airplane can do a 17 knot crosswind um is that really the day that you want to be doing your your soft field and short field landings in. I mean, so decision making makes a big difference and um, understand what it means to do all the maneuvers you're going to do on that day. And, and a lot of times this is what actually ends up causing the failures. It's not just, hey, did I botch the maneuver? But why did I botch a maneuver, you know, and, and was it the conditions, was it the decision chain that brought somebody to that? Um, I do want to point out, it's kind of interesting, we, we've had a lot of turnover of instructors in a couple periods. Uh, if we look back in 2017, 18, 19, we had really active airline hiring um, and CFIs were disappearing. And, you know, the average CFI was maybe doing four or five students um, training before they went off to an airline. And then um, through 2019, 2021, that hiring decreased and we're seeing CFIs that stayed in their job jobs for a lot longer while they were waiting and now we're back to really heavy hiring and um, interestingly in, in that time period where we had really active hiring and CFIs weren't staying what we'll call in service you know doing the job for a long period of time um, we had a four to five percent increase in failure rate across the board so you know one would logically think a lesser experienced CFI um, probably doesn't have as you know as a, this grizzled of experience to teach their students right we're getting better at this as we do it longer and, and the cfis have been doing it for a longer period of time tend to have a better pass rate and um, i'm maybe actually a little concerned that we may maybe see they're that again. trying harder right the, the, the do, you know dotting more i's and crossing more t's certainly uh, possible yeah because you're because you're worried that your student will fail so you you go that extra mile and maybe you give them a little bit extra time or or more groundwork 
we certainly know there are some that do that, but we also know there's a lot of CFIs that, uh, you know, they are focused on getting to that airline job. And, um, you know, this is actually something we've seen in a lot of cases too. And if you're a student listening to this, um, as your CFIs are getting ready to go to the airlines, if you're, if you're bouncing between a couple of CFIs, make sure things aren't getting missed. And I've seen this on multiple occasions where students have, uh, have had two or three or four CFIs in their training. And, you know, maybe they end up with one right at the end that, that covers the last five or six hours of flying. And, and sometimes we assume that their previous CFI covered material that, that uh, maybe they didn't. So make sure you're, you're working if you are seeing transition of CFIs. Um, make sure you're working with them to make sure everything's covered before you come to that, uh, that test. And, you know, I've had just instances where it's something as simple as, hey, let's show me the emergency descent. And, and they say, I never did that. Um, what do you mean you never did it? It's in the ACS. And, um, you know, that's a, it ends up a failure point on the check ride and, and would kind of poke back at it. We find, well, the two CFIs ago, maybe he forgot it. And then they, they got a new CFI and uh, they just assumed the last guy had done it. So, um, you know, if you're seeing things like that with instructor transition, make sure you're really focusing as the student also. And obviously if you're a CFI um, doing this, don't assume the previous CFI did everything to make sure somebody is ready for that practical test. Do, uh, does that end the check right there? I, you know, it's a, it's usually not a good moment, right? I mean, the, the, we're on the check ride, we have a maneuver that's required. And, uh, and sometimes they choose to try it, um, even though they don't know what they're doing. And in a very rare case, they get lucky. Um, but in most cases, um, <laughs> it's better it doesn't, to be lucky doesn't than go good, well, right? right? I mean, um, we, we kind of have some maneuvers where you, you might kind of be able to kind of guess your way through it. And um, it's not outside the standards, so you haven't failed. But, uh, um, but a lot of times it certainly ends up in a disapproval at that point. And, and is that really a failure of the student? Well, not entirely. I mean, sure, the student should have taken the time to go through that AC and make sure that before they go to the test uh, that they're familiar with all the maneuvers that they might be asked. But, uh, but it's really the job of the CFI. They're the ones signing off that applicant for the test to make sure that they are prepared and, and can consistently meet those standards. So um, it, it's, it's a tough spot. Do you have the option of, uh, of continuing on with the ride and do the other tasks and then bring, this, bring the applicant back to, to complete that one successfully? And will you do that? So there's, there's kind of a, um, a, a guidance that's given by the FA here, right? So we, we cannot retest items that somebody has not satisfactorily, you know, met the standards on. Um, we can continue a test after something has been unsatisfactorily um, test, you know, so if somebody goes out and we say, look, you know, your first landing was the short field. You've said, this is my short field landing and we, we botch it, you know, we're 200 feet short of our point. And the applicant says, boy, I'd, I'd like to finish my last two landings and they haven't scared us sufficiently bad that we're feeling comfortable with that. Um, we have the option as long as both the applicant and the examiner agree to continue with other maneuvers. Um, you know, it's kind of a discretion point. It doesn't mean you can come back and then test. And if you, you know, if we have something we've issued a disapproval for, doing the rest of the maneuvers isn't going to erase that item. You're still going to have to retest on the item. Um, but we have the option to continue if, you know, if both parties agree. Um, and it depends on the individual and, and how that's going in the weather and the day. And it, it's a discussion point. And both of the individuals in the plane at that point, the examiner and the applicant have the option to say, I'd prefer to let's just go park it today. And, and, and certainly if we have something that's a safety issue or concern, um, examiners are going to stop it at that point. And, and it's also, a, I guess there's a human factor here too, right? I mean, if we have an applicant who we've got a whole bunch of pressure on this day and it's rattled them enough, um, we don't really want to just keep beating up on them either. So a lot of times we will say, you know what, let's just head back to the airport and we'll park it and we'll finish up the rest of the things another day and, and retest the item um, that was not within standards. You mentioned the ACS, Airman Certification Standards, and the old PTS, uh, Practical Test Standards. Not every rating has the ACS. Does the advent of the ACS uh, improve things? Has it made a difference? So I think it has, uh, and if I was heavily involved with the, the original writing of it and, and some of the, the stuff that uh, got meetings going to get it there. And um, what it really did is it, when properly used, gave the applicant and the instructor a reference point for not just the practical test, but also their knowledge test info. And, and we've characterized the information, you know, with the knowledge, skill, and, and risk management areas. And um, on a practical test, I actually think it's made our tests a little bit more efficient. Um, we don't have to test every single item in all of it anymore. We get to sample. Um, there are certainly some sections where there's required areas, but a lot of it, it's uh, select one knowledge, one risk, um, and do all the skills areas. And, and we build those 
into scenarios, um, which I think really gets people thinking a little bit differently. It makes our test very, very much focused on the scenario and less rote in nature. And that's a really important part for people to think about on these practical tests. We're looking to see not just can you spit back a V-speed or um, identify an airspace, but show us how you're going to apply this information. Um, so we know that when you go out in the national airspace system with all of us, we're, we're doing it properly and we can work together. So I, I think that has improved it. And we are, as an industry, working pretty hard to get the, the rest of the ACSs out there. I think the next one um, we'll probably see will be the CFI, which is pretty cool. I'm looking forward to it. Um, and those CFI tests are long for not just us as the uh, applicants when we take them, but certainly for us as examiners too, and um, will allow us to kind of bring that test into alignment with what you're teaching. How many applicants uh, never make it to the airplane? They just uh, crump the oral and you end it there. You know, I honestly don't have great uh, statistical data on that. I've got some anecdotal. Um, the CFI practical test is probably the one that least frequently gets to the airplane that most um, frequently has the disapproval issued on the ground. And um, there's a lot of administrative stuff that we need to make sure CFIs know how to do and um, the teaching side of it. And that's probably where um, more CFIs end up uh, not getting through the ground portion. Um, the private pilots, you know, a lot less. I mean, most people get to the airplane. Um, you know, if I had to guess, it's probably 85% of the folks that are going to make it at least to the airplane. And then we have a little drop off there if we have some maneuvers that are challenged. Um, but uh, the ground is, is usually fairly strong. Um, we've got some hot button issues on the ground that tend to be hiccup points. You know, proving the airplane's airworthiness is still a, a problem that we run into on a lot of uh, tests. They, you know, the instructor says, here's the airplane and go. And, and we have to see on a practical test that you can identify that that airplane's airworthy. And that tends to be kind of a weak area yet. So um, sometimes we have some of these hot buttons, but for the most part, um, folks are getting through the ground and, and getting to the airplane. If I were to ask you, uh, are pilots better trained today or not as well trained as they were when you started your aviation career, what would the answer be? Oh boy, this is a tough question, right? And I, I hearken back and, and without throwing myself under the bus, I look back some days and think, my God, how did they give me a license when I was 17 years old with what I knew, right? And um, I honestly think we're doing a really good job of training pilots these days. And um, there's there's training programs that do some things better than others. And um, it depends on what you're, what you're asking for. And I, I think the one thing that we have done a fantastic job over the last couple of decades of, of, of training and implementation of new stuff is making more information available for pilots. We have much better weather information and, and we test it in a lot different way. I mean, I think when I was learning to fly and the old Pan Am weather mation system at the airport that I thought it was pretty cool. I could get a METAR from somewhere without having to call. And, and now we get to pull this up on our, our tablet devices and, and have weather everywhere in the country. And we get to ask all this, this stuff on tests. I think so. Pilots have a much better understanding of information if they're taking the opportunity to use it um, that, that helps them make better flight decisions. And um, we have a lot more material that we're getting them, you know, even things like we're doing right now, right? You know, just sharing this information. When I learned to fly, nobody could have watched a podcast like this and gotten kind of the tips about some of this stuff. I think it's um, really cool there. You know, I always think that we do still need to focus on those stick flying skills though, right? Um, we, uh, we many times get get bogged down in the box. We got our, our cool GPS in the panel and, and we got our, our nice EFB, but look outside the window sometimes too. And um, both like you and I fly older airplanes, sometimes that doesn't mean we're not going to show up on their ADSB traffic um, information. So, you know, focusing on those, those hard flying skills, I think is still really critical. Um, but the one thing we really have done is, is made information so much more available. And um, I think pilots knowledge base is stronger than it's probably ever been. So if I, if I were to kind of extend that question with a related idea where are uh, applicants strongest where are they weakest so I think that kind of depends on the program. I mean, if we look at a lot of the large university programs, the strength that they have um, is really in the systems management that, that they're being taught and the integration. Those, these are folks that are really being trained for the purpose of going to an airline. And if I, I think back to some of the time I had up in, in Oshkosh and some of the local flying there and, and young 16, 17 year old kids learning at local um, airports on grass and, and cubs and champs, um, you know, the folks that learn there really learn the stick flying skills and so I think it depends on where you learn to some degree. And, and that means we've got to try and, and get 
people experienced in multiple different realms if we're going to make them well-rounded broad pilots and i think that's probably our biggest challenge is to not just focus on one of those realms don't assume that the person who's going um through an academy or, or a university is just going to fly at an airline um that they're just going to be flying a crj they might you know they've got a license they want to go fly on the weekend and that 1956 172 we, we need to make sure we give them those opportunities and skills too would you say that on balance uh, these applicants have the necessary stick and rudder skills? Can they do good crosswind landings? Can they do good short field landings? You know, it's a, it's a fair question, and I don't know that I, I can give you a, a solid answer. I think it depends on the individual and, and their dedication to it, right? Um, how much do they want to put into building that skill base? Um, I do, you know, generally think it's important that we focus on this yet, and um, I don't know that it always gets as much focus. You know, we, we very much focus on the, I need to get the experience, I need the ratings, I need to get the certificates and move on. And, and I think sometimes uh, the best thing we could do is just take a pilot who's learning and say, here's an airplane, go fly somewhere. I don't care where, get out, fly. Don't think about you know a specific checkbox today, but just get some flying experience. And um, that probably does more to help build those skills than, than any prescriptive item that we would build into a syllabus. So your brother-in-law is about ready to go take a check ride. It's not going to be with you. And he asks you, what advice can you give me to be successful in this check ride? So it's a good question. And uh, I would definitely tell anybody I know that I've flown with, don't do with the check ride with me, especially if I've given you any training, because I already know your weaknesses then, right? That's evil. Uh, we don't want to make it harder for them. We want to give them a good, good chance. And, and the best advice I can tell you on a practical test for everybody is breathe, get a good night's sleep, you know, don't do it at the end of the day of work. You know, this is something you need to be prepared for. Take your time. Um, certainly don't do it if you haven't flown in three weeks. You know, we had some some data a few years ago we looked at in a, a large training provider program where we saw, you know, after two or three days of flying, we saw a major drop off in pass rates. And, and by day 10, after no flying, the pass rate went down to like 40%. I mean, so you need to keep those skills sharp going into a check ride. And, um, you know, if it's been two weeks since you've flown in, today's the first nice weather day that's great but maybe that's the brush up day that you should get and be a little bit patient with it uh, make sure those skills are sharp and, and go into it knowing the examiners are not there to fail you um, we're there to try and see if people get through this i mean the honest answer for us is it's more of an inconvenience when somebody doesn't pass um, than when they they pass because we've got to come back and, and do it again and we don't want to do that either so um, we like to see good qualified applicants and um, you know know what's going to be on your test is probably um, the best advice i can give and it's it's dangerous dangerous when people show up to a test and uh, we hear things like I've never looked at the ACS or the PTS. Uh, make sure you know what's going to be on that test, prepare those maneuvers and, uh, and you'll be fine. All right. Well, thanks very much. We've been speaking with uh, Jason Blair, a veteran instructor and designated pilot examiner. This is uh, the second in two podcasts uh, here on the AvWeb channel and on YouTube. Uh, and you can click on those and learn about uh, pilot certification trends. Jason, thanks a lot. My pleasure always. See you later.